This is Marvin Glotfelty. I'm a hydrogeologist and uh, licensed well driller from Arizona, here to give you another NGWA industry connected video. And I want to talk to you today about how words make a difference. We hear that from time to time, oftentimes on the, in the context of politics or uh, social issues, but you know, they make a difference in our business too. And so I want to talk about how we need to be have an awareness of that and address it. Um, so I want to share my screen here. So if we've got two people talking to each other at a well site, and one of them says something like, we're going to spud in and turn to the right. The other person may not understand them properly. Or if they say, well, if we hit a tight connection, then we're going to run a gel sweep. Or of course, the response will be, OK, I understand perfectly, which they don't. This is you know, intended to be a joke, but you know, it's kind of real. I bet we've all encountered something like this before because we've got different people in our sections of our groundwater professionals that have their own lingo. So um, we have drillers which have an entire um, very descriptive, but not understood by a lot of the other folks in our industry. Consultants, we have engineers and hydrologists and geologists, all of which have their own um, techno babble that they use. There's administration people that are just worried about what everything costs, and so they don't understand anything, but they have the purse spring strings, and so we have to be sure that they have an adequate perception of what's going on. And then there's the water system operators. They're just trying to meet their peak day demand. So we all have our lingo. We might say things like spread in and turn to the right. Uh, hydrogeologists might say words like transmissivity or lithologic. Uh, the, the other folks are, they're just confused by that. They're trying to understand what's going on and they're gonna have to own and operate these water systems. And so we wanna communicate better with them. And it's not just, uh, for idle chat. It's real important so that if something goes wrong, then is there somebody going to get blamed or is it just act of nature? It can be either one in our business. And so um, letting, letting that just unfold itself and trying to understand it as you, uh, without uh, some upfront effort is unwise. And so we try to, try to do it up front. So let's talk about how we can try to manage that and the first thing we're going to do before we actually drill wells in many cases is have our, our, our design for the well, the technical specifications. We'll have things, uh, this is not comprehensive, but it's quite a few of them. You know, we'll talk about where we're going to put the cuttings. Are we going to just spread them at the side or do we have to haul them off somewhere? Noise control. That can be extreme sometimes. In the photograph I'm showing, this was an actual site for a uh, municipal well where they just bought a lot for, that would have been in the middle of a development. And we had occupied houses on three sides and a street on the fourth side. So this uh, had to be, this drilling site had to be um, surrounded by sound walls so extensively that now we almost had a uh, confined area issue, a health and safety issue, because working in an area like that is dicey. And yet this was a 24 seven drilling job and we had to, we had to manage it. So this sort of thing can become a big deal as you know, you can easily imagine if you're going to go and talk to the homeowners around to explain to them what's going on, you can't use extensive drillers terms or hydrogeology terms. You have to use lay terms that are understandable and reasonable because they're going to benefit from the water supply, but they're going to have a construction site right in their, their little neighborhood for a period of time. Water disposal. That's a big deal because where is that water going to go to? Um, I think that that's amongst the most highest concerns at any new drilling site is where is the water going to flow to? We have to address not only uh, actual hazards of, of putting water in a low area and seeing where it will flow to, but also uh, regulatory issues like NPDES permits, et cetera, because uh, even, a, even a low spot can be a water of the United States. Materials requirements, so many different materials we can use. They cost different things. They, they have different 
properties and so what what are we going to use and and why and so um going through all this is a big is a big deal really for the people that that guy with the rose colored glasses the uh the business guy who is going to pay the tab we need to explain to him why one uh, material that's a little more expensive might be appropriate for the best uh, long-term use of the well. Contractor qualifications, you know, we have a lot of highly skilled contractors, but we also have some not so great ones out there, just like every other um, sector of any industry. So we just need to call for, what do we need? Is it, is it health and safety uh, records? Is it just equipment records? You know, is there is are you going to get uh, references from recent clients? There's a lot of different ways to do that. Drilling methods at any one site, there's no there's no single way to do a well, and there's also better and worse ways depending on the hydrogeology and the location and the eventual need of the well. So here's three examples on the left: a rotary rig, cable tool in the middle, and dual rotary on the right. And there's many others. So there's no one single way to do wells, but it should be not just assumed, but specified. <clears throat> there can be cases where two or three different methods are acceptable. Fine, say those methods, but don't leave things unspoken. That's the problem with technical specifications that leave things to be. What if the, what if the well's lost? Is that always the contractor's fault? It's not. But uh, if we say nothing about it, then that's going to be the default position of many folks. They're going to call the lawyers and, and start suing each other. And that's a real shame because it's not correct. Sometimes there's active nature and we need to accommodate that. Uh, there's law circulation conditions that can happen. There's low penetration conditions that can happen. Other things can happen. We need to, uh, uh, we, we may not know the details of them, but we can address how such situations can be assessed defined and then addressed fairly to all parties. We do that up front in the technical specifications. Those bids will be more competitive and the work will go more smoothly. And the end result, the end well, is going to be more of a high quality beneficial well for that well owner. Unexpected or changed conditions, those certainly can happen. We have not only hydrogeologic challenges, but also weather in, in, in climate weather conditions or other problems that can be not the control of the contractor, but can arise. And then protection of the well site. What if uh, what if somebody accidentally bumps into a wall and, and chips it, or if a heavy a piece of equipment cracks a curb? You know that whose whose responsibility is it? Was that crack pre-existing? These sorts of things can be addressed. Equipment requirements that goes really to the drilling rigs, but also to other associated pieces of equipment. Well, development requirements. I, I too often hear of folks that just skip over this and they have an otherwise perfectly good well. It was never fully developed and so it has big time uh, problems with its efficiency and productivity. Uh, the required reports and records. We want to have a good documentation, so we, we, we want to state this. Plumness and alignment requirements. For some wells, it doesn't matter very much because we're not maybe, what if it's a piezometer? We're not even gonna put a pump in it. What if it's gonna have a submersible pump? And as long as that can fit in there, it doesn't have to have a nice straight hole. But in other cases, we might have a deep set vertical turbine pump that will have bearing wear and problems with it, unless it's a pretty straight and aligned hole. So it just depends on what the ultimate uh, intent for the well is. And there's other considerations. But again, the problem seems to arise when these are unaddressed, unstated. So we just don't want to be silent on things. We want to go ahead and, and address things as comprehensively as we can. So for considerations, there's two categories, really, calling for the process or calling for the result. So if I'm going to hammer a nail, I can say the result needs to be the nail that was driven into that board. The process can be you need to take a claw hammer and, and hammer and whack it a few times until it's all the way to the hill. That's that's the, what I mean by the process versus the result. And there are two different approaches. There's two different levels of responsibility. The process has to be clearly defined and measurable. You can't just say until it seems pretty good or until I'm satisfied. It's got to be 
that nail be hit. Payment must be based on that measurement and payment. So you can't just have it be uh, an hourly um, task from a payment standpoint, but a uh, the something that's on a linear foot when you're actually measuring it in the field. <clears throat> and the responsibility when when the contractor does uh, bids on doing a process and they do that process properly, they should be paid regardless of the result. They have no um, responsibility for the result. It's just the process. Now, if you call for the result, that changes things. The expected result, again, has to be defined and measurable. Um, and it has to be connected to, uh, to the ability of the contractor to control it. So you can't uh, put a burden on the, the contractor for a well to make a certain gallons per minute because that's part of that is the aquifer characteristics. People do that, but I think that's a, a less than perfect way to uh, to try to require things. Things only what's in the control of the contractor should they be responsible. Uh, and for that, they should be fully responsible. And the payment must be connected to that, uh, what has been measured. So in this case, the process uh, is is to uh, achieve the result. They 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 have now taken on that responsibility. If you call for the result, then they get paid based on the result, not on based on they they went through the process properly. But they can do it any way they want. If you call for a casing installation, for example, and you were expecting it to be welded, the contractor decides to have threaded connections. That's their choice if you call for the result. If you call for the process, you might say welding will be done in this way and so on and so forth. So it depends on how you're calling for, is it the process or is it the result? And of course, in a, and when you call for the result, that's when the contractor owns that responsibility. So we have a lot of different sources of communication breakdown and we want to be mindful of them and avoid them. So in well design, it can be in terms of the materials, depths and dimensions. Be very careful about this. Be sure your units are clear. Uh, tons versus metric tons, um, meters versus uh, feet or inches, so on and so forth. <clears throat> Drilling technology, we want to be very clear on this, exactly what is expected, what is to be bid upon, because when you have a competitive field when you first write technical specifications, it's during that time of competition that we want to clearly define everything we're expecting so that it can be done in that manner. People can bid fairly against one another. So we have these different lingos. Contractors and consultants have our own way of saying things. So do operators and other stakeholders. So we just need to be careful and mindful to be sure it seems so simple, but it is actually very difficult for us to communicate well with one another. Because when we're dealing with groundwater, it's all underground, it's all not visible. And we may understand it so clearly, but unless uh, unless we can communicate that to others with our words, written or verbal, then we can have breakdowns of communication which lead to problems. So it's, uh, here's a couple of examples of just being careful. Hook load versus mass capacity. Those are not exactly the same thing, and they make a big difference. You can talk to your uh, rig suppliers, experienced drillers, and, some, and material men about that, and they know all about that. Tensile strength versus safe hang weight. You talk to well screen providers, and I know the difference between that, and I can talk to you in detail about that. Lump sum versus per each. Uh, contract people will tell you that lump sum means there's only one of them, like a mob de mob. Per each, if we're going to do something seven times, then that's different than lump sum. And then lawyer people will tell you that negligence, that means it was your fault, but probably you and some other people were at fault. If it was just you, then it was sole negligence. And then should versus shall. We go back and forth between those, but really, if we want to have an absolute, it needs to be shall. So with that, I thank you. Be careful with those words. They do make a difference. And uh, not only choose them carefully, but go through the effort to use lay terms, explain to people, draw pictures if you need to, and uh, and try to communicate well exactly what we're doing. It does make a difference. It makes the job go better. 
Thank you. And I'll talk to you next time.